Well, thank you, Shelley, um, and uh, thank all of you for coming out tonight. Uh, when you hear about Dora, that I'm coming before Dolores Huarte, it's uh, pretty daunting. Um, I don't have 11 kids either, but uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, and also I'd like to thank uh, the c colleagues at Esri, uh, Jack uh, and uh, Laura Dangerman for. Uh, their uh, support and uh, the University of Redlands and the Town and Gown Organization. Thank you very much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, it tonight, uh, I'm going to talk about um, trees. Uh, I'm going to talk about forests. Um, when uh, Jack asked if I would be interested in talking about some of Winrock's work, it's a fairly daunting uh, prospect because, number one, it's daunting to come in front of such a distinguished group of people with such a, um, a varied uh, backgrounds and uh, basis of understanding and knowledge, including colleagues from Ezra who are going to know far, far more about geospatial than I, I do. But uh, I wanted to find something that I thought really encapsulated a couple of different things that I think are really important. Uh, and I chose to look at Winrock's forest work because I think we've done some of our best, most analytical, most recognized work around the world in forests, number one. And so I think it's a good example of, of uh, showing how science put uh, to the public good can be a transformative um, uh, endeavor. And uh, secondly, because it's so important. Uh, the, the health and, uh, and well-being of the world's forests. I can't really think of any subject which is more important now than looking at how we preserve, uh, how we extend, how we protect uh, uh, the world's forests, and how, but yet we do that while maintaining those forests as living, productive ecosystems. And so you're going to hear a little bit about that, but first you're going to hear about me. Uh, the, uh, uh, I was asked uh, to uh, talk a little bit about, so talk about yourself, which, okay, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Alabama, that's where I'm from. Um, as uh, Shelley referenced, I'm uh, originally from a little town, whoops, I've got to use the laser, um, a little town about right there in Alabama. North Alabama, which, uh, let's, let, let us not forget, in 1931-32, North Alabama was the Papua New Guinea of the United States. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was as poor, if not poor, than any other part of this country. Uh, a, a, a large majority of the residents of North Alabama had no electricity. Very few were connected to anything remotely like safe drinking water. Uh, a, a range of scourges uh, from uh, foot and mouth disease to ma uh, malaria to diphtheria. Uh, the life expectancy was in the 40s. Um, it was, uh, it was um, uh, a development basket case. And then something came along called the New Deal. And the New Deal raised my family out of poverty. Um, there's no other way to, to say it. The New Deal was the most successful development project in the history of the United States and, and one of the most successful in the world along with the Marshall Plan. Why do I bring that up? Because that's one of the reasons I was attracted to come to Winrock because uh, I, I sort of look back at my own life. My grandfather was a farmer. He was a subsistence farmer. Um, he, uh, uh, he lived uh, crop to crop. Um, there were no paychecks. He lived um, a, a meager existence, uh, and uh, a development project lifted him, my extended family, out of poverty to the point now that Huntsville, Alabama, which is about there, which is where I went to high school, is now one of the most prosperous cities in the United States. In fact, a report came out just today, it has the fastest uh, uh, job growth rate in the United States for jobs over $75,000 a year. Uh, and in 1955, it had a population of 15,000 people and was known as the watercress capital of the world. And now it has the metropolitan area is 300,000 people and Boeing, Northrop Grumman, NASA, the Marshall Space Flight Center, uh, uh, Samsung, LG, everybody is there. 
Um, maybe that's why I decided to get into this career. I don't know, but um, uh, it's, uh, it's been an extraordinarily rewarding opportunity for me. So what is Winrock? Winrock is a global social enterprise. Uh, we seek to empower the disadvantaged, increase economic opportunity, and sustain natural resources in the United States and around the world. So we work with some of the poorest people in the world to uh, uh, improve their agricultural practices and uh, improve their access to markets on the ag side. In our energy group, we bring electricity and uh, uh, um, the, all the benefit, economic benefits that come along with that to uh, very poor people who live in many cases off the grid. Uh, we uh, help fight human trafficking. And by the way, we do most of this thanks to all of you because most of our funding comes from the United States government, the USAID and the United States Department of Agriculture, uh, ergo the U.S. taxpayers. So thank you. Thank you for my job. I appreciate it. Um, the uh, four things that undergird Winrock, uh, the, the things that we believe are central to what we do, we are results focused. We believe that our work must demonstrate impact and those impacts must be measurable. Uh, and they must be measurable by um, peer reviewed or uh, widely recognized standards uh, to indicate that we are in fact doing what we say we'll do. Locally owned, we believe in engaging local populations. We believe in finding out what people need on the ground um, and then trying to deliver that. Uh, a very important one, excuse me, while I master this, uh, is we are science-based. We believe the best available science and technology uh, should drive our decisions, and not just the harder natural sciences, but also economics. We believe in um, uh, sound science and good economics. And we're market-driven. Winrock um, uh, generally does not believe that the charitable model in development is the one that will be sustainable and long live. We believe that the best way to lift people out of poverty is to uh, connect them to markets, local, regional, or global. Uh, if there are either agriculture work or uh, energy work or even in our anti-trafficking work, we believe that the best thing we can do is to provide people who may be trafficked uh, through labor trafficking with the information to make better decisions in their own employment decisions and then work with their employers to demonstrate to them that uh, it is incumbent on them to also be active and engaged in the effort to prevent trafficking. So across almost all of our work, we, we believe in markets and we believe markets are the best way to keep uh, uh, people uh, engaged and keep people economically viable. Uh, so, from Alabama, now we're in California. Uh, when I was asked to speak, I started thinking about California, and uh, it's a state we know well. Winrock International owns something called the American Carbon Registry, which is the registry whereby people trade carbon credits uh, under the California Cap and Trade Program. And... Uh, we develop methodologies that allow that uh, trading regime to exist. But uh, for tonight's focus, California, it got me thinking about forests, and it got me thinking about uh, what inspires me about forests, and it also uh, got me thinking about 200 miles north of here, the great sequoia and redwood forest uh, that uh, have come to so define uh, or be part of the definition of Northern California. And uh, it, uh, 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 when I did a little research, I came to understand that I didn't know this, that the first uh, uh, national park ever d designed to save a living organism was here in California. Sequoia National Park was developed to save the sequoias. Previously, it had been an effort to preserve land. And it was not by Teddy Roosevelt, as I thought, but by Benjamin Harrison. So it predated Teddy Roosevelt by... Uh, a full decade. Um, John Steinbeck, one of your greatest writers and my favorite author, said uh, of the, the Sequoia's cousins, the Redwoods, uh, they, uh, uh, they are the ambassadors from another time. And uh, that's the way I think about forests. They really are that thread, that, that sort of mythic thread that connects us to uh, previous generations in very, very important ways, connects us to the future. Uh, forests, um, 
represent 50% of the entire land area of the world. Two billion people rely on forests for food and shelter. Uh, and forests house more than three quarters of all flora and fauna on the planet. So, and that's even before we get to the environmental uh, benefits. They regulate temperature. They largely um, uh, regulate precipitation. They uh, contribute to water flows that sustain human uh, and agricultural populations. And uh, the contents of the air, well, what you breathe every day, uh, you can thank a forest. This is a wonderful illustration of that. Uh, uh, one of my colleagues pointed out when we put this slide in, the way to think about forests, forests are the lungs of the world. Uh, this uh, is a uh, time motion slide. This shows, it's NASA technology, and this shows the carbon dioxide concentrations um, uh, over uh, uh, the course of a year. Um, it shows the, uh, where carbon dioxide tends to congregate. Uh, and then if you go to the next slide, which is not coming up, but uh, it will, I promise, is the uh, slide that demonstrates uh, the, oh, how the, you can see down at the bottom under Africa and South America, see that pulse that's going on? That's the, that's the rainforest breathing. I, 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 it, it literally is the rainforest taking in uh, carbon dioxide that's being released in the northern hemisphere. This is the organic nature of forest. And it literally is a living ecosystem. The world's forests together form a living ecosystem that all human life relies on. It's just awe-inspiring. Um, but however, the world is undergoing um, an unfortunate transformation. Um, we are converting forest land to agricultural uh, and um, um, settlement uses faster than any time uh, in history. We've lost over half of the world's original forest. Most of that has been in the last 30 years. This is a picture from uh, Brazil of clear cutting. Uh, as a colleague of mine described it, when you see this in um, uh, satellite data, or even when you see it in topical <laughs> photos like this, it looks like an ugly brown gash in a beautiful green canvas. And the, well, unfortunately, we're seeing these ugly brown gashes all over the world. However, I started this presentation by saying this was an optimist view of the forest. I believe that there's hope. There's great hope for us to uh, disrupt this trajectory and change the course of the future of the planet. And the way we can do that is through the application of technology. Technology got us in this position. Nobody clear cuts land like this with axes anymore. Uh, this was done with uh, a very sophisticated, uh, expensive, heavy machinery. Uh, it was done with um, uh, sea, sea going vessels to take the lumber to markets. It was done with computers to find buyers for this market, uh, these products. Uh, uh, it, was it was the result of uh, the perhaps uh, misapplied application of technology, but by applying the appropriate technology, we can reverse this trend. But sometimes the best technology starts with the most simple. Uh, that's why this presentation is called From the Tape Measure to the Satellite. Uh, I want to take you from that tape measure, uh, which is one of the most rudimentary tools that uh, foresters like my colleagues at Winrock use to help measure the health of forests. Um, uh, here is a, a picture of a uh, uh, forester in Vietnam checking the, uh, the girth of the tree in order to help determine that tree's carbon sequestration. Um, this is the, the way that uh, we still do projects where we have to go into forest and uh, use tape measures. 
uh, but increasingly we are able to use much more sophisticated technologies, which you will hear much more about as we go forward. So we're going from the tape measure uh, help for us all the way to the satellite. So we're going to be about to uh, talk about how we've uh, been able to harness some of this technology for the better. We're going to start with a world tour. We've started with Alabama. We went to California. Now let's go to Vietnam. Um, Vietnam is a country I was asked today at lunch. Now tell me a country that my lunch mate said where development, you could make the case that development has been a success story where development writ large, not just in forestry, but maybe focus on forestry for today, has succeeded and the, the, the country has benefited from that intervention. I said, one I can tell you is Vietnam. Um, the, um, I'm gonna tell you the story about uh, a, a da uh, three dams in Vietnam. Uh, uh, Hydropower dams in the Sun La province in Vietnam. Sun La is up here uh, in Vietnam, it's sort of right about there. Uh, the Da River runs from, actually originates in China and runs down into uh, the ocean and cuts a swath across uh, northern, the northern part of Vietnam. Um, there were uh, three uh, large hydro uh, power dams that were built in the Sun La province, um, and something happened. It became almost immediately clear that the dams were in trouble. And they said, what does this have to do with trees? Uh, what it has to do with trees is the dams were, um, the next slide will show the location of these dams. Uh, here it is. This is the Sun La province. In Lai Chau, Sun La, and Hua Bin were the three dams. The, not long after their construction, it was determined that they were accumulating very large and um, uh, fat, much faster than expected silt deposits. Why were they developing silt deposits? This is why. The red shows areas of high forest loss. And when forests are cut, uh, particularly when they're cut indiscriminately without any sort of land planning, silt, uh, as you know, forests, one role trees play is they help compact dirt. They help keep uh, healthy soil. But when you deforest or degrade forest, the, the, the soil is more easily becomes runoff, and that runoff then runs into the Da River and becomes silt in the dams. It shortens the lifespan of the project and requires expensive dredging to counteract. Again, you may ask, so what does this have to do with trees and forest? What we did is we were able to uh, develop a program called uh, the Payment for Forest Environmental Services. And the, uh, the uh, Payment for Forest Environmental Services, what it does is the, um, the hydropower operators in Hua Bin and Sun La uh, and uh, Lai Chau, they realized that their projects were going to go south. They, were, they lost their original investment. They were having to spend money on expensive dredging. The solution to that, why not pay the farmers and landowners not to cut their trees? Why not pay them directly or pay them through community trust banks so that they would actually sequester that, those, or keep those trees planted, but both sequestering the carbon and limit, limiting the silt runoff? So Winrock, my organization, went in and developed a program where we worked with both the hydropower operators as well as the farmers all around these dams where you see all the red, all the way up to the Chinese border. And we helped create financing institutions so that the hydropower operators created these funds to pay the farmers not to cut their trees or not to let their uh, trees be, uh, the forest they may own, be degraded. And uh, so far, we've helped 25,000 landowners. These are small, uh, largely disadvantaged. Uh, and we have, uh, through this program, $300 million has been redistributed to the, the uh, farmers and landowners in the Sun La province. Uh, everybody wins. It's a win-win. It's market-based. Um, it focuses on a, um, a, a locally developed solution, much as I talked about before. It has been an enormous success to the point that Vietnam 
is the first country in Asia to adopt uh, payment for forest environmental services as a national policy. So now, anytime you engage in a water-based project, be it a dam, be it a uh, irrigation, large-scale irrigation, you have to do an assessment of the impact to the local community and the impact to the forest. You may ask also, why does Vietnam care so much about forests? If, you, if we go to a full map of Vietnam, I'll go back quickly. Uh, the Mekong Delta, many of you, some of you may have been in Vietnam. Uh, some of you may have served in the U.S. military in Vietnam. Everyone knows about the Mekong Delta. The Mekong Delta here in the uh, southern part of the country, I'm sorry, when I said Sun La, this is Sun La, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, Laos. This is Sun La. The Mekong Delta here in the southern part of Vietnam uh, is one of the most vulnerable watersheds in the world to climate change. Uh, every, um, every foot of uh, uh, increase in the level of uh, sea rise is going to have a devastating effect on the Mekong Delta. And the Mekong Delta goes all the way up through uh, Laos and Cambodia, uh, all the way to the Thai border. And this is going to be a disaster, not just for Southeast Asia, but for the entire world. So Vietnam has a huge interest in both protecting forests, and protecting the climate, and battling climate change, working on energy efficiency. So as a result, this is an example of where local solutions to helping save forests has been a tremendous success. Um, the next part of our world tour, we will, this is a picture of the, that is the Sun La River. Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about a... Uh, another type of program that we've been uh, successful in implementing. Um, this is how it works. If developing countries, if we're going to represent those over here, the, the developing countries of the world, um, demonstrate that they are reducing forest loss at a national level, the global community should make investments in these countries with these countries to retain their forest and retain CO2 and not release it into the atmosphere. This is um, an opportunity for the wealthier countries in the world, recognizing the deleterious effects of, of uh, not mitigating carbon, can play a positive role in helping countries like Guyana, where Winrock has been engaged for almost a decade, preserve their forests. Guyana is a, a country about the size of Washington State. It has a dense tropical forest that covers 80% of the country. How Guyana decides to use that land will have a demonstrable impact on climate change for all of us. It is one of the most important parts of the lungs uh, from our previous slide in the world. In 2009, Guyana started working with the government of Norway. Why The government of Norway, like Vietnam, has a very keen interest in climate change. Why? Look at the map of Norway. It sits on the North Sea. Uh, it has an enormous coastline, very susceptible to rising sea levels. They desperately want the rest of the world to understand that uh, for many of us, we are very interested, very concerned about climate change. For Norway, it's existential. Norway is also a very wealthy country. It has an enormous uh, 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 sovereign wealth fund that's been developed largely through the development of its oil resources. So now the country has decided that they have to put those oil uh, resources uh, and oil assets to work. How are they doing it? They want to work with other countries to help those countries sequester carbon to prevent contribution of CO2 to the atmosphere and thus hastening uh, climate change. Um, uh, so the Guyana has, with well, Winrock and Esri's help, developed a satellite detection-based approach to rapidly identify and characterize disturbances to forest cover. Let me show you an example. This is 2010. Um, They've been able to develop a, project, a program so that 
they can with pinpoint accuracy show where deforestation is happening in agriculture with yellow, in logging, brown, and then settlement development in the orange. And so what Guyana has asked Winrock to do, in order to be able to participate in these sort of schemes with other countries to receive money for sequestering their forest, you have to know how much forest there is. And within those forests, you have to know how much uh, carbon exists in those forests. So uh, Guyana worked with Winrock, again, using ESRI technology to help create a census, a forest census, on a national basis. It's a na so we can tell you with uh, a very high degree of certainty the number of tons of carbon that are sequestered in the, the forest of Guyana. But we can also tell you with, uh, uh, with regional and sub-regional accuracy what's happening to different parts of that forest, either legally or illegally. And uh, here's a, uh, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Felipe, who is working with foresters in Guyana to, dip, to teach them uh, different methods to help measure um, uh, forest cover and thus be able to measure the carbon footprint. Um, this work was pioneered by one of my late colleagues, Dr. Sandra Brown, who was truly a uh, pioneer in this work of carbon forest accounting which is what this work is largely uh, uh, falls under. She was a pioneer. She was uh, part of a Nobel Prize winning team in 2007. She was the articles editor for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which won the Nobel. Most people think about Al Gore winning that Nobel. Well, Sandra Brown won part of it too. Uh, and uh, we're very, very, very proud of her. Um, and... Uh, um, the other interesting thing that I found about our work in forestry, this is fascinating. It's socio, it's anthropological. It's, it's, it's something fascinating to me. You go to any country, they have a disproportionate number of women who work in, this, in the forestry commissions. And, I, and, and I've thought about that a lot. Why is that? And I don't, I'm not sure, but I think it's something to do with, you know, the, these women, they feel something primordial about protecting a natural resource. Uh, these are all women, members of the Guyana Forest Commission that we train to help participate in the forest uh, census work. And uh, it's just really inspiring when you go and meet these folks. Uh, it really gives you hope for the, for the planet. Uh, so moving on from Guyana, this is going to talk about another breakthrough that uh, Winrock has been engaged, involved with, also with uh, uh, the help of ESRI technology, uh, degradation versus deforestation. We talk a lot about deforestation. I've talked a lot about it, uh, about it tonight. We talk about de degradation less than deforestation. What is degradation? De uh, deforestation, the brown gash, right? Remember that? <sighs> Come in, take out large swaths of forest. Degradation, harder to see, but when you take out most often illegally, parts of a, a forest, forest fires contribute to degradation, wood fuel collection uh, in areas that don't have reliable electricity. You combine all this and what you get is degradation. I like to call degradation sort of the comb over of, of uh, forest, right? It, it looks fine from a distance, uh, but when you get it really up close, you say, ah, that's not, that's, that's not very attractive. Uh, but it's, but in, in the case of forests, it's not very healthy. And most importantly, it has enormous uh, negative impacts. So what Winrock took upon, we took upon ourselves and we got some grant money to look at the issue of degradation. No one had ever measured degradation as a contributor to uh, 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 carbon emission. And so we developed a technique uh, using remote sensing and algorithms to come up with a global estimate of degradation. And the number we came up with was 2.1 billion tons. By way of example, some of these, here are the amount of tons per year that different endeavors around the world are said to contribute to uh, 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 the emission of carbon. One that gets a lot of attention is the international aviation. 420 million tons. Look at this number, 
degradation contributes 2.1 billion tons a year to 5x the amount of aviation, 3.5x of global shipping, and uh, about 70% of waste management uh, uh, exercises around the world. So degradation is an enormous problem. Here, our technology we developed, um, and or we, the analysis we did with te the technology, largely ESRI technology, uh, we were able to also do this on subnational levels. So not only can we talk about degradation globally, but we can go, say, to Brazil, and we can look at the relative rate of degradation in Brazil, or this is Central Africa, the sort of the wooded breadbasket of, uh, of Central Africa, and this is Southeast Asia. And you can see the red, not good. Uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, uh, Indonesia, uh, these are areas where degradation, forests are being destroyed tree by tree. And the information now allows us to help countries, uh, help uh, international bodies like the UN uh, come up with better policies to help prevent degradation as well as um, deforestation. Um, and selective logging causes impacts that are not always apparent with traditional aer aerial imagery. And the LIDAR technology uh, allows us to see the canopy in three dimensions, uh, which is what I was talking about with remote sensing. So uh, we get to this dimension, and this uh, is a fascinating. Uh, it, it color codes degradation in a, uh, in a forested area uh, and so that we can tell authorities down to almost the hectare where the worst cases of degradation are occurring. Last in our world tour, uh, this is some uh, attention we got for our degradation and the logging work that I just talked about, uh, which has gotten widespread attention from uh, uh, the global scientific and advocacy community. Uh, the last part of our world tour is Cambodia. Uh, Cambodia has the largest um, uh, amount of what we call ground level forest cover left in Southeast Asia. Uh, it is a beautiful, vastly forest, forested country, but it's the fastest, it has the, the fastest deforestation and degradation of any country in the world. Uh, we, um, we were asked by uh, USAID and invited in by the Cambodian government to help them figure out what's going on in our forests. So Winrock worked to develop something called West Tool, the Watershed Ecosystem Service Tool. What is West Tool? West Tool is a very sophisticated tool that allows you to look at multivariable. I don't, I, I'm not a scientist, by the way. I'm a social scientist, but uh, I'm not a forester, so uh, this is a multivariate analysis that allows you to look at multiple variables that are affected by forest loss. In other words, the Cambodian government said, what, what does all this mean that we're losing this forest? Well, the West Tool allows us, it shows land cover and land cover changes for the entire country every year since 2000. It interprets, it, interprets the changes on, on uh, uh, issues like water availability, uh, and it uh, looks at sediment and nutrient uh, loss in rivers, uh, two rivers, among other variables. And as a result, it allows you to have one of the most sophisticated analyses of the effects of deforestation. Why? Okay, you would think, well, everyone knows it's, a, it's, it's bad. Poor countries have to prioritize, right? They can't just say, we're stopping all deforestation. They need to know where are the effects of def deforestation and degradation the worst. So this, for example, uh, shows you uh, the changes. This is a watershed change uh, over the course of... Uh, the last 18 years. Uh, this is sediment loss over uh, those years. Um, and this was uh, predicted change in water tables over those years. So uh, uh, the Cambodian government now has the ability to look at all of our data and they can say, well, we know that water loss here 
is particularly severe. And also it's severe because not only are you losing groundwater, you're gaining salinization because of uh, uh, sea level rise and coastal erosion. So this is an area in absolute crisis. So the Cambodian government can now say, we know that whatever we do, we cannot ignore deforestation and degradation in the southwestern part of Cambodia. Uh, because otherwise this is going to become a denuded wasteland. Um, and uh, here it allows us to say, yep, and um, overall the area around Ton Lace, uh, 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 Lake is in a lot of trouble because of, uh, of uh, uh, and multivari the multivariate overall vulnerability to climate change because of deforestation is uh, particularly bad. Uh, in uh, the Tonle Sap area. Um, the, uh, this is an example of, of where we're able to show time lapse on different, these different uh, uh, variables from left to right between 20 and 2015. And you can see how the colors change and they intensify. Look at this, 2000 uh, on nitrate loss, no nitrate loss. 2015, look at that. That is that is a disaster for fresh water when you lose that much nitrate in that uh, relatively short period of time. Fish die, uh, uh, waterside foliage dies, uh, the rivers choke to death. It's a dangerous situation. So now the Cambodian government is able to have real-time information that allows them to make decisions on where to put their scarce resources to uh, save uh, uh, ecosystems in Cambodia. Um, and uh, um, we've done training with, uh, uh, these are students at the University in Phnom Penh. We now use the West tool to do training. The West tool is a uh, web-based uh, 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 software and uh, it's available to anyone who would like to use it. So we do training. These are young environmental scientists in Cambodia that we're training to know how to use the tool. So this is my uh, Idi Amin moment. The, uh, this is, I, I was going to wear this, but I couldn't get it out of the, uh, uh, the, the display case. But this, was the, uh, this was, is a medal that was given to Winrock by the government of Cambodia. It's the Royal Order of Sahametra, which is the highest civilian honor given, uh, that can be given to a foreigner in Cambodia. We were, we were given the Royal Order of Sahametra for our work helping the Cambodian government and the, Cam gov the Cambodian people understand their environment, understand deforestation, degradation, so they can manage it better. Very, we're very proud of that. Next time I come, I'll wear it, I promise. <laughs> uh, the, uh, um, so uh, so the, 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 the scientific and technolog technological advances the last 30 years have really accelerated and allowed us to understand this world so much better than we ever could. Um, and we're able to use technology. Uh, as I've mentioned, every project we've talked about tonight uses Esri technology. So, and I'm not just saying that because I'm in the Esri forum either. Uh, uh, it, is a, a, it is an invaluable part of the toolkit that Winrock uses, uh, our, uh, our uh, climate and uh, forestry uh, specialists use every day uh, to help our clients and help people better understand the impacts. Um, but, for, but to, to recap, forests are the barometer of the health of the world. And in an age of technology-driven knowledge, um, the other thing to, uh, that uh, modern technology, geospatial, uh, remote sensing does, it allows for transparency and the transferability of information, which is really the way we're going to save the planet. And uh, we can develop the science and technology, we can build the tools, we can merge development activities with technology. Um, we can take this from the field and the forest to the cloud and back. And in the course of doing that, we can harness and revolutionize the way that we uh, honor the planet. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it, you know, I'll say one other uh, in closing. Um, this is a, a photo from the early 1960s. Um, uh, to talk about why I'm an optimist, right? That's why I started. 
We had another big problem in 1960, 61. India was on the verge of mass famine, as was the uh, uh, Bangladesh uh, or in that uh, Pakistan at that time, both east and west, Nepal. Large part of South Asia was on the verge of a of a historic famine. Um, and the world was, if you remember the old Malthusian formulas, the world was doomed, right? We were growing. We, there was no way we were going to feed the world. Uh, it was, a, uh, it was a, a, a very dire situation. Uh, here's a picture of some of our scientists back uh, in the 19, early 1960s uh, working with some, uh, uh, their colleagues in uh, this, I think this is Indonesia, which was also threatened with a famine uh, at the time. Um, and to show you that Winrock's been around a while, I don't know anybody that wears those hats anymore. Uh, but, uh, and then this gentleman came along, Norman Borlaug. I don't know how many of you know Norman Borlaug. He is one of the most unheralded uh, uh, heroes of the 20th century in the United States. He, not, not completely unheralded, he did win a Nobel Prize for his work in helping uh, stave off that famine. Uh, Norman Borlaug, Dr. Borlaug, is generally thought of as the father of the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution transformed our world, along with the polio vaccine, uh, along with the introduction of uh, 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 modern sanitary techniques in hospitals. Uh, uh, it was... It is estimated that the Green Revolution saved one billion people in the 60s and 70s. Dr. Borlaug did this in, with, along with colleagues all over the world by developing better strains of wheat and rice uh, and uh, uh, introducing those in India, in Indonesia, in Mexico. And he was, uh, uh, because of that work, farmers in these countries were able to dramatically uh, raise the level of production. Uh, Dr. Borlaug in the Green Revolution is not without some controversy. There are people that believe that it ushered in an age of various uh, uh, plagues like monoculturing, and et cetera. There, that's a, a subject for another day. Uh, he is a founding board member of Winrock, so uh, as far as I'm concerned, he's my hero. Uh, he uh, he's really has been an inspiration for us for uh, all these years. Uh, the... Uh, 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 I'm going to skip ahead past the thank you. I can't go that fast. I did want to mention, too, that uh, Dr. Borlaug was very close with the Rockefeller family. Uh, some of you may know Winrock is uh, short for Winthrop Rockefeller, one of the uh, brothers in the third generation of the family who was, along with John D. Rockefeller the third, his brother, are the, really the, the founders of Winrock. And uh, we were we came out of this sort of determination by the family to uh, do something to, uh, with their family's great wealth on scale to help the world. And uh, uh, Winthrop and John Dee used parts of their fortune, and, uh, but more importantly, as importantly, their networks to really help establish uh, Winrock International, for which we are eternally grateful. I can assure you, though, we, we don't get any more money from the Rockefeller family, but uh, uh, we are happy for the uh, we do. That they they help set up a small endowment for us, and we're instrumental in the early uh, the beginnings of Winrock. So we are nothing but eternally grateful for their support, uh, and we're also grateful for the support of great great partners like Esri, uh, that we are constantly looking for other ways that we can work together, uh, because there aren't many organizations where every day you wake up and say, "I'm going to make this world a better, safer, more prosperous." Uh, healthier, more economically sustainable world. I'm very, very fortunate to be a member of, and part of uh, an organization that does that, uh, as does Esri. Uh, so uh, again, to all of you, to the host, uh, thank you. Uh, forgive my, forgive my uh, mistakes uh, that uh, undoubtedly I've made some. If you're a forester in the audience, you can leave now. Just go out the back. <laughs> There's a little uh, place for you to escape. Uh, as I said, I'm a I am an uh, enthusiastic social scientist in, tonight in Forrester's clothing. And, uh, but uh, I, uh, I just really want to thank all of you for coming for your interest. And uh, if I could answer any questions, uh, I'd be happy to uh, try to do so. So thank you.
And okay, I went, ladies and gentlemen, this, we're, we're serious tonight because we're recording this uh, program. So we definitely want you to raise your hand and wait until you have a microphone or otherwise we won't be able to get your um, question on the recording. So we have the beautiful and talented Charlotte uh, Burgess and Christopher Walker. And we have our first question right here. Uh, Ma'am, if you would introduce yourself and then ask your question. My name is Heidi Hutchinson, and my question is, I was interested in hearing about paying the farmers to sustain their forests in Vietnam. Um, has anyone thought about growing coffee under the canopy? That's a pretty common thing nowadays. Do they do that? Well, it's funny you mentioned that. Um, they're, they're, in fact, Vietnam is uh, one of the, uh, ha also has one of the fastest growing coffee production increases in the world. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's, they've, discovered that they can grow specialty coffee in Vietnam. And uh, there's a, as you, many of you know, there's a little local restaurant called Starbucks that'll buy as much specialty <laughs> coffee as you can grow. And uh, so Vietnam is actually growing. I, I must confess, I don't know if they're growing it in the Sun La province along the Da River. If they're not, maybe we'll recommend they do so. But uh, it is a fast-growing crop. And as you also know, Vietnam has a very hill hilly terrain in the Central Highlands. as a perfect area to grow coffee. That's one of the reasons they're increasing their coffee production. Coffee is a very interesting subject. That'll be the subject of my, my talk next week. Uh, <laughs> because coffee is a great crop to be able to substitute for lower-value crops to raise people's incomes, uh, smallholder farmers particularly. Uh, coffee is another crop that can be grown by smallholders. It doesn't require plantation-level uh, farms. So you can scale it based on whatever land holdings you may own. And we've been, my organization, Winrock, has been very involved in helping start the uh, coffee industry in Myanmar, especially coffee industry there. Uh, and we've seen great success in raising the incomes of uh, disadvantaged uh, farmers there. So thank you. All right, you're over here, Chris. Uh Hello, I'm Jane Roberts. Um, two questions, really quick. Uh, with the Trump administration not th too enthusiastic about uh, climate change, have you had uh, your funding uh, remain at an acceptable level? And number two, do you ever take into account um, that there are 14 billion new people, I'm sorry, one billion new people every 14 years on this planet? Okay, how wanting, am I going to answer those two questions? <laughs> uh, thank you for the question. Yeah. And uh, right. I, I promised I would not get political tonight. Uh, um, I, you, I, I'm sure we have people here who support all different uh, manner of political candidates and the like. Uh, but I'll just answer your question factually. That, uh, yes, uh, foreign aid has, is under quite a bit of duress in this administration. Um, the, the last two budgets that have been proposed, cut the State Department budget, which includes the USAID budget for foreign aid, uh, but under the State Department general appropriation, both years by 30 percent recommended that they cut the, so cut that, that includes the diplomatic corps, consulates, U, uh, foreign aid, um, you name it. And uh, uh, both uh, times those efforts were beaten back by and I, to be show that I am, Winrock is rapidly nonpartisan. Uh, the biggest defenders to beat back those cuts have been the Senate Republicans. Uh, people like Bob Corker um, in the Senate, uh, uh, Lindsey Graham, uh, Ben Sasse. There have been a, a, we have went, a, tremendous support by Republicans in Congress because I think. Uh, and it doesn't, I mean, we, we take whatever support we can get because we believe in our work, but I think uh, particularly Republicans believe that, uh, that building healthy economies and uh, stable populations is a way to promote peace and stability in the world as well. Uh, and uh, so both, and then most recently, three weeks ago, the administration tried something called a rescission. I don't know if any of you heard of this. To free spending at the State Department um, and for un under some, uh, some justification under a previous budget act. And then at the end of September this month, any money that had been frozen would revert back to the Treasury, and that was $3 billion uh, development money. That effort was also beaten back, also by the Republicans in Congress. 
So yes, it is, uh, and, and, I, and again, not a political statement, it's just a fact that you, we remember what Donald Trump, we have, it's a family audience, so I won't use the word, but a certain, mis, certain name he called the countries we work in, mostly. And I spend a lot of time in those countries, and uh, I know a lot of the people in those countries, so you take it a little personally. But, so yes, we're under quite a bit of duress. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I must say that it's been very heartening to see the support across the aisle from people who understand that uh, peace and prosperity is uh, it's important in the United States. We all know that. Uh, and, but it's not a zero-sum game. That's the reality. We were able, and in fact, there's a lot of evidence that development, successful development projects around the world save us a lot of money and, uh, uh, over, uh, over time. Uh, General Mattis, the sec current Secretary of Defense, before he became Secretary of Defense, was the chairman of an organization which I belong to called the United States Global Leadership Council. And he, he said something at a congressional hearing, which now we talk about all the time in, uh, in a hearing. He said, when questioned about the need for foreign aid, said, if you cut aid, you, you, you need to buy me more bullets. And uh, I don't like necessarily the militarization of these issues, but nonetheless, there is a certain poignancy to that comment. And uh, particularly coming from someone who is, uh, now is the, runs our de uh, Defense Department. So uh, uh, the second question about the billion people added, um, the, it's, it's, uh, it, it continues to be an issue. I got a little anecdote about that. Every day, every day, 5,000 people move from the countryside of Bangladesh into Dhaka. Every day into the metropolitan area of Dhaka. The, this population explosion is happening in two ways. The rural areas, of, a lot of rural areas around the world are depopulating, at the, and they're moving to the cities at the same time that we're still adding people in those cities. So you can do the math, right? There are 365. DACA's adding a million and a half people to its metropolitan area every year. So it's, it's already at 25 million people. So... The, we're, that that's also has to be part of uh, macro level development is we've got to look at ways to um, both encourage healthy population growth. And again, I don't, I, we, our organization does not do, we're not in the family planning business, but I think it's imperative on country, for countries to look at uh, ways, multiple ways they, they can control the, uh, the, the population. Uh, particularly as these people are poor. Cities cannot support, in the developing world, cannot support for 30 and 40 million people. They're a disaster waiting to happen. Do you have another, any other, there's one in the back there, Shar. It looks like you've got one in the middle there, Chris. We'll see who gets there first. I think it's gonna be Shar. Okay. My name is Andy Hoder, and I've witnessed firsthand large sections of forests here in the United States that have been devastated by infestations of the bark beetle over the last 20 years or so. When these areas are uh, afflicted with the bark beetle, the only way to salvage the damage is basically to cut the tree and turn it into lumber. Of course, what you end up with is something that looks like uh, what you call a clear cut. What can Windrock do to mitigate that particular problem? Oh boy, um, the you know I'll tell you what when Windrock. Uh, I'll be very blunt. I think what Windrock can do is support the uh, U.S. Forest Service and the United States Department of Agriculture and their research efforts to come up with antidotes or um, re responses to the bark beetle challenge. That's not. We, we are not experts on, uh, with some, in agriculture, there are some areas we, uh, we know quite a bit about infestation problems. Uh, we, that is not the area of our, our primary area of expertise. However, um, we uh, do very, very strongly, we work with USDA and Forest Service professionals uh, around the world who are trying to tackle, but in, not just around the world, but also in the United States who are trying to tackle this problem, we're smart enough to know that we don't know, that's not our area of expertise, so we typically will bring in tree 
professionals, uh, forensic specialists on tree health to help us. We, we run into these similar problems all over the world. They mean other parts of the world, they're not bark beetle. They may be something else. Fungus often uh, is a culprit. And uh, we're smart enough to know what we don't know, honestly. And uh, um, we, so we often bring in uh, folks from the Forest Service, for example, on our projects when we, when we run into these pro, uh, problems. My, my advice would be strongly, strongly support the U.S. Forest Service and the USDA R&D labs uh, around forest health because they're the ones doing the yeoman's work around this. Someone over there? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm Kathy Havert, and I'm going to ask a question similar to his. We have a variety of small conservancies in this area, and we realize that there are a number of our forests that have diminished considerably due to bark beetle, climate change, all of that. And I was wondering whether your organization actually does fund some of these smaller uh, community conservancies that really do need that access to funding so that we can get projects going. Well, I, I should have mentioned this at the beginning. Winrock, we, uh, we are an implementer in that we don't, we're not a grant maker. We don't fund organizations. We are the organization that gets funding to do implementation for, uh, we do the work, right? We, we're not the grant maker or the philanthropist. We, uh, we, uh, we get revenue from the, uh, as I mentioned, the USAID, from other uh, foreign governments, from the Germans, the Norwegians, the Swiss, uh, foundations like Hewlett and Packard and uh, uh, Kresge and the Walmart Foundation. They so help uh, pay for our project. So we're not the ones that actually make the small grants, with some exceptions, where we are actually asked to regrant money on behalf of a funder who wants to go out and um, to do projects, and we would do grants mostly for uh, other community-based organizations. And most of our work also is uh, in forests. Uh, most of it is uh, international, with the exception of some of the work we do around uh, uh, what's called RED, uh, the, uh, the, the deforestation and degradation work here in the United States through the American Carbon Registry. That's really where we've done most of our uh forest work here in the United States. But we, we're not a grant-making organization. We're a grant-seeking organization, actually. <laughs> so so uh, um, we'll pass the hat later. <laughs> we have one more question. Yeah. Uh, my name's Cliff Dolly. I was just wondering, do you see any way to utilize timber as a resource without having unacceptable consequences for the environment? Okay, that's a great question. I, I forgot one of the tag, my little taglines in the presentation, and that is my staff often say, you can't put fence around forests. And what that means is a lot, and I hope this came through, a lot of Winrock's work is we believe in some cases conservation, prima facie is a good idea. But in the developing world, again, in a, in a world of re constrained resources, the forests have to be productive. Right? People use the forest. They, they, sometimes they uh, use the forest for uh, foraging. They, uh, they may have wood-based businesses. Maybe they uh, do uh, small-scale scale construction. Forests do produce assets, which if properly managed, can help the disadvantaged and those people that live in those forests. People live in these forests, and we believe that in the developing world particularly, the key is not to fence, ring fence forests and say you can't use this forest. How do you create opportunity? There's a great picture, and I wish I put it in this, of a, uh, when I was in Bangladesh, I was in the northern province of Bangladesh, and there's a, the, 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 the largest um, uh, forest that's still intact in Bangladesh is there, but it's been degraded. And it's been degraded by poachers, illegal logging, and animal poachers who are, are slowly degrading the economic value. One of the things we did, we created a volunteer as part of a very large project on biodiversity. We created a very large forest uh, protectors program. Every volunteer, oh, actually, these weren't volunteers. We actually 
uh, managed to get the local province to pay them a, a, a salary, a small salary. Every one of the protectors was a woman. And I've got this great picture of me standing around 40 women in these green outfits, and there's not a woman uh, taller than 4'11 in the picture, which is unfortunate in that it's also, there's a lot of stunting in Bangladesh, and these women were mostly in their 40s and 50s and grown up in an era with malnutrition. Uh, but what's, what I love about the picture, so I'm here, I'm not a small guy, and these, these women, not one above five feet, and half of them are carrying big sticks. And what they do is when they see a poacher, they blow a whistle and like, you know, three of them will collapse on this guy and just start beating the... <laughs> and the reason, the, 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 the premise of that is that these, to these women... This forest is their, this is their workplace. This is where they make their livelihoods. A lot of them, you know, they pick berries, they make, uh, uh, they, they do canning, and they grow, they have vegetable forests and uh, ve vegetable patches in the forest. They use the forest as an economic lifeline. To them, this is, this is not, this is not a nice thing. This is essential. This is existential. Uh, and so next time I come, I'll bring it. It's, a, it's such a fabulous picture. And every one of them, the stick is taller than they are. <laughs> so, you know, you used to imagine. I said, God, I'd hate to be the guy that got caught poaching, <laughs> poaching something in that forest. Uh, so, yes, it, it's, it's to, to Win, Winrock strongly believes that it, uh, you, you have to create economic, economically viable activities in order to preserve and sustain forests very often. It's the only way that you're going to get public, private, government cooperation around, around the effort. Thank you again very much, Rodney, for being here. Thank you very much. <laughs>